It's three o'clock. Uh, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, my name is Alok Brara. I'm publisher of Indian Infrastructure and Powerline Magazine. And uh, I have the honor of moderating today's session uh, with such an eminent group of experts. Uh, this is uh, desalination in India, and uh, it has been uh, supported and sponsored uh, by IDE Technologies, and we are grateful to them for that. Uh, we the format is as follows: where we'll begin with a what we call a baseline presentation uh, by Dr. Uday Kelkar. You all know him, Managing Director of NJS Engineers India. Uh, he'll be making the presentation outlining the key facts, trend, and issues, uh, and that will be for 15 minutes or so. And then we will have a discussion. Uh, for an hour to hour 15 minutes uh, between the different panelists. I'm going to introduce the panelists only afterwards. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kilker first uh, and we'll have his presentation and then we will uh, have the panel discussion and I'll introduce the panel at that time. Of course, Dr. Kilker will be invited to stay on the panel as well. We will occasionally go to him as well. Okay, uh, let me introduce Dr. Kwek Kelkar. He is uh, Managing Director, NGS in India. Uh, he's Director of India Operations. Uh, NGS is uh, a Japan in world company. He's got almost three decades of experience in process design of water and wastewater treatment projects. He's worked in US, in Middle East, and in India. Uh, worked with just all kinds of issues. I think uh, when we first met him, he was uh, one of the premier evangelists in India in reuse, uh, when, when no one was talking about the reuse of water. I do remember that. And, uh, and he was fighting a very lonely battle at that stage. Uh, over the years, uh, he's fought many other battles, you know, uh, whether it's uh, recycling or reuse, uh, whether it's wastewater, whether it's, you know, landfill issues, et cetera, et cetera. He's a civil engineer by training, also has a PhD in civil and environmental engineering. It's my pleasure now and, and a privilege to request uh, Dr. Kilker to kick off this webinar uh, with his presentation. Sir, you can start sharing your screen. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Alok. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Let me just see if I can get this done. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. And can I request the, can I request the other panelists to please, please mute? Can I request the other panelists to please mute? Sound sound. Dr. Kilker, go ahead, sir. Um, good afternoon, gentlemen. Very glad to see all of you are safe and sound and healthy. In uh, this one second, Dr. I should just mention we have already 139 people logged in, so you have a big audience. Wow, wow. Um, so I'm really happy, and I wish all of you are very safe and healthy for the near future. So we need to be safe, not fear off. Uh, let me just give you this is just I wanted to start with the honorable uh, minister's slide from one of his presentation on water issues. It, most of us know it. It doesn't have a distinction about desalination, obviously, because uh, many of us don't want that. Maybe it's costlier. But we do need to start looking at desalination. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to combine, as Alok said, I do have another hat I wear. And using desalination for wastewater recycle and reuse becomes more effective and manageable. And I'll say why I say this at the end. Um, this is, this is just the India picture. You have most of desalination is gonna probably occur on the coast side, wherever it's possible, or may have on, on the brackish water side, on low groundwater, but certainly desalination doesn't need to be seawater desalination, can be a reverse osmosis or an EDR for a recycle reuse and making this availability of wastewater purely towards drinking non-portable and portable systems. Um, I don't need to give this. IDA uh, has been giving this, and IDE is uh, in the forefront of uh, building plants world over. So this is kind of just briefing the idea for them. 17,000 plants, 107 meter cube, million meter cube per day, 146 million liters cube per day outlined in cumulative. Um, what interesting to me is particularly in India, we don't have much uh, plants or may not be there, maybe hardly one or two in terms of MED and MSF type. Most of us have focused towards the RO. Um, the the 800,000 meter cube per day is the largest. Um, however, India's largest plant will come on board sometimes another couple of years or maybe three, four years from now in Chennai, uh, funded by the Japanese bank. We are doing the design engineering for them as a part of the team are uh, uh, run by SMEC as a lead. So it's a 450,000 meter cube per day, certainly will be the largest plant in India to go out with. 
Um, quite an interesting thought that was brought by Niti Aayog in 2019. So I took this slide uh, point from the Niti Aayog's D cell uh, discussion that, hey, we could use uh, seawater or D cell water for daily chores for our systems. Um, I'm going to skip some of the slides. What I need to bring to you guys to think about it, and I used to use this slide for recycle and reuse. Um, I've just modified this to think about why desalination might be a solution to coastal regions, A, versus fresh water. I mean, source availability and location for fresh water is a big issue for cities. They are bringing water to 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers at times. Uh, in terms of desalination, it's a captive resource. It's your, it's your coastline, it's the area you are in, and it's drought proof. The rivers can go into a drought mode, but the, the seawater is not gonna get into a drought mode. So you have a lot of water available. Technology has changed from 1980 to 90s to 2000. I mean, the cost of treatment has gone considerably lower and lower as the membranes improve, the membrane manufacturers improve the material because of the material science, improvements in technology, improvements in nanotechnology and so forth. You're getting a much better membrane uh, flux through process, much better cost reduction in the operation. Where the lack is at this stage is the energy use. And there are still plants which are trying to minimize the energy and also recover the energy through energy recovery system. So it's, it's a big, big change. So we need to look at it, desalination as a favorable option, uh, looking at a, a captive resource and we can use it. And at the end I've written that significant capex and opex, short distances for distribution cost, but is now reducing substantially over the issue. We could also use for applicability of farmers. It is not applicable at now because the farmers don't have to pay a certain cost, except I think in Maharashtra, where there is a water regulatory authority can charge it to the farmers, depending upon the usage. Most of the time, the water is free. So that starts forming, that particular give you an idea that the water can be utilized for a variety of usages with a cost. I'm not expecting a full cost recovery at that particular point, but at least some cost will give you a value for your product that you're gonna use it. So that's how I would like to look at it for D-cell. And I think we need to do that. If you really compare the cost wise, and I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead of the gun. Uh, if you really look at it cost wise, somewhere around 50 to 60 rupees per kiloliter, is that what you typically get at the outlet of the plant? You get the same type of cost when you're bringing water for say city of Bangalore or, or maybe other city like Hyderabad, where they're, they're bringing water to 100, 200 kilometers away four stage pumping. So essentially you land up with a similar water cost. So why not consider this for the regions where it is adaptable? Uh, I'm not gonna go into maybe ID guys can discuss much more about it. In general, desal will have two or three or four major cover areas that you need to look at it. A, the water quality It is very essential, very important because that will change your pre-treatment process, whether to use a dissolved air flotation, whether to use combination of DAF and um, lamella plate settlers, or whether to use a pressure filtration versus sand filtration versus uh, micro or ultra filtration before the water is fed to your RO plant, uh, because that will limit, that will give you a better SDI, so density index before the water is going on top and will basically save your RO units over time period, then becomes your uh, RO units, and then post RO units is your refinishing. Uh, refinishing means adding carbon, bicarbonates, salts, anything else that has been removed through the process. For a general term, I'm saying, particularly you need to pay attention here with respect to boron. Uh, typical boron salt concentration or boron concentration within Indian peninsula area is about 3.4, 3.5 milligrams per liter. This, the WHO standard is 2.4, uh, 2.5, 2.4. And, and sometimes the industry or sometimes the client pushes for less than one milligram per liter or maybe less than 0.5 milligram per liter because ISO 10,500, I think, um, requires as less than 0.5. And it becomes an issue with respect to cost because within one single pass RO membrane, you can get less than 0 uh, 2.6, 0 0.8 range. So that means one, less than one milligram per liter. But if you insist on going to an ISO 500 range, 
then it's going to be 0.5. That means you will have a two pass system. That means two so upper units side by side. By side means you have two and you get, and you two get the, and you get the uh, 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 reduction to boron. That's one. Second aspect is also you need to look at bromide, uh, in particularly wastewater areas where there is an industrial input going, because then you chlorinate it, you will get a, a bromo trichloride and, and any other compounds. And then the last one is distribution system, which is typically changes from client to client area distribution and the need. Um, RO, where we have in India is the big horse. Um, this is a picture taken from the IDA's, IDE's website. Um, you can have plan design, single type, base type, double or half plan configuration just to use it. And honestly, I'm not going much details into technicals because I thought most of you have a background in designing and when it comes to designing issues, we could always look at it, uh, the system wise. Um, as I said, refining, this is another critical point, particularly the discharge of your brine and also the, T, the TSS that is coming into your waste, in, into your water. Most of the plants typically discharge back into the sea because if you look at it, your TDS and TSS concentration within a distance of say two kilometers or two and a half kilometers versus the cost of associated with treatment of these solids on, on site at the plant and then disposal off to any other location. That becomes a, a cost effect, that doesn't become a cost effective solution. However, before we take a decision how to discharge and how, to, how the intake locations are, I would suggest, and most of the clients do, is do the bathymetry study and dispersion modeling. Because with dispersion modeling, you can get an accurate data over a nine months to 10 month period, how the movement of waves and, and so forth. And I was, I was fortunate while I was doing my uh, PhD work for one of the summers, I was able to work in the Delft's uh, model, which is called as high in casting shallow water waves. And that is now being used nowadays for dispersion modeling and so forth. So I was really happy how that is getting connected in the system. Uh, here's a kind of uh, some of the graph that we have done for Chennai, uh, where Chennai is a 450 MLD plan, which shows that how the dispersion modeling will take place in terms of the diffusion going into the discharge as well as the intake points. Um, one of the things I have not come across in India, but I would like to suggest to the designers, the engineers, the contractors, is to start looking at uh, a pigging method for, for uh, into your uh, intake head for cleaning up the plant pipe rather than placing every 100 meter or 200 meter a manhole for cleaning because that manhole adds up a lot of uh, connectivity issues, a lot of uh, uh, um, systems problems over the years. So if you have a picking type, uh, I'm not sure India has any one of those plans, but we probably would like to introduce you to some of the others where you have a neoprene type of uh, pig that flows through pressure from one end to other side of the, of the intake and gets it cleaned over, over a period. It's a very effective ways of, of doing pipe cleaning. Here's, the, here's that particular pig I was talking about. Um, has that energy and this is what it goes into the pipe. These are the rubber O-rings that you can remove it and, and place it new if they are worn out and, and, and so forth. Ultimately, whenever you want to design, design a treatment process, there are several methods, several processes, several combinations thereof. Every uh, large scale uh, construction operations company uh, will look at it, what's their best, what they have done for in terms of design, build and operate, and in terms of revenue, in terms of CapEx and OPEX and so forth. So we need to look at it, what's the projects that have done and how they have done and what the systems are. Um, this is just the data on China. One of the things I'd like to bring to you, one, one of the planned data that I'm reviewing right now is kind of interesting that the total organic carbon concentration coming into a plant is, is substantially higher, plus there is no pretreatment happening there. And I'm a bit surprised by this data. Maybe I don't have that background uh, as as some of in a, in a in a in a C such a high TOC values, high in the sense almost 150, 200, 250 values. Typically, I've seen less than 100, less than even 50 milligram per liter total organic carbon. So, is there the possibility that the analysis might have been done through COD? 
and the conversion of COD to TOC may have given these high values. Unless there is a pipe going direct discharge from a sewage treatment plant to that particular intake location in the sea, you would not get this high, high, high TOC. Uh, if somebody corrects me, yes, they can see this high TOC, I'll be very happy to talk, but I've not seen in my little experience such a high TOC in any, any of the treatment plants that I've visited or I have, I have worked on. So that's a critical. Um, in recent years, you can do hybrid auto design combinations thereof, different manufacturers, different combinations, and you can certainly use uh, to verify your design by using manufacturer's design models, which are supplied to you free of cost, or they will do it for you. So certainly you can look at that. Uh, Cost-wise, if you look at it, seawater RO systems, typically um, you get about 31%. Replacement is about 6%. Intake discharge is about 11 Power, which is the major consumer, is about 26%. And if you look at it, O&M, the, the power is about 35%, depending upon where you are and what's the power cost and so forth. So it is a costly affair, but it is a consistent, it is clean, and it'll give you what you want, no matter where you stand, 24 by 7, 365 days, unless the plant is shut down for some other unit operations. This is the breakup of one of the logic that we're doing right now, um, and, and it's fairly matches with where we are. We're looking at about Indian scenario at 4.5 uh, per unit uh, in INR. Um, and I think it shows that the power is significantly higher, almost there. So we can start reducing power. Looking at this, since power is extremely high, there have been projects, there have been plans where alternative power has been utilized, like for example, windmills, like for example, solar systems. But the size of the units that use for are smaller, 10 MLD, uh, 5 MLD, and so forth. So that's not yet done with solar photovoltaic cells for a, such a large plant of 100 MLD or 100 MLD or 200 MLD and so forth. Um, this is from IDA, and I think there are in a fair numbers. Um, what I want to bring to your attention here, and that connects me to the next one, especially the electrical usage area. In the year 2016-17, they were looking at uh, 3.5 kilowatt hour per meter cube as the standard average electrical usage in the system. And they were shooting for, um, in five years, to 2.8 to 3.2 um, kilowatt hour per meter cube range. We're somewhere around between, it, it's between three to 3.5 right now. But what I'm trying to come back to you is, this is particularly for seawater, large scale plants, um, TDS ranging from 39,000 to 30, 32,000 to 39,000 to 42,000 range. But if you look at it, even Singapore, Singapore has uh, the, the energy used in the same, same range. They tried to do it, but it didn't work. Finally, they're in the same range, 3 to 3.5 kWh plus per meter cube. But if you look at it, the energy use for wastewater through an RO system the actual energy use is only 2, 2.2 kWh per meter cube. And the water quality that is coming off the seawater through the system and the water quality of the reverse osmosis through the wastewater is absolutely same. There is no, there is no difference at all. So what I'm trying to say that is we should also start looking at in ways that we can use recycled wastewater through an RO system to augment the surface waters or the seawaters to reduce the cost. And here's the last slide I would like you to take you to, is the three sustainable approaches in addition to continued freshwater resource management. 60%, we can continue to do develop new desal plants, coastal regions, design and OM, brine discharge standards, and so forth. The 25%, I would like you guys to start focusing with government support, with public awareness campaigns. It's like this, if you build it, they will come. If you build the plan of five MLD or two MLD, no profit, no loss, and showcase it to the people. They will understand what it is. Data showing and data delivery and, and bringing it in front has a more knowledge than, than to build the plan. Why Singapore is successful? Because their premier stood there, drink that water, or drank that water, and said, here, this is the water we need to look at. It. They are not directly providing it, it, it uh, to the people. They are going it to the surface water reservoirs, then to a treatment plant, and so forth. Only one plant in the world does this, directly toilet to tap, what they call is, is, is uh, in Nairobi. So anyway, we don't have to go there right now. And the last one is to press 15% of your time and expenses and uh, projects into aquifer storage and recovery, ASR, 
and surface water augmentation using your RO systems uh, to maintain that you have enough water available. I think, in my own opinion, and I think most of the most of the experts uh, out in the field keep on saying it's the management issue. If we manage the water right, we'll have water more than the years 2050 or more. So it's just the issue of that. And I think I would like to stop there. Hope I'm in time for you guys. Alok? I have to unmute myself. I forgot to do that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kelkar. Uh, if you were standing in, uh, in a room, if you were in the room, you would have stood up and given you a applause for a very good overview. Uh, and now we're on to the panel discussion. Uh, sir, you can stop sharing your uh, screen that's, now. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, Nikita, can you um, give it a speaker view now? I mean, gallery view. So that we can see everything. Gallery view now. Yeah. Okay, great. So it's gallery view. At the top, view, they'll have optional speaker view or a gallery view. If you pick a speaker view, then you'll be able to see all the speakers are there. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the panel to you very, very briefly. Uh, we have uh, with us, and this is in alphabetic order, uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar, who is with Shapurji Palanji and Company Private Limited, has experience of almost three decades uh, in water and wastewater industry, currently working as overseeing project overseer for Shapurji and Palanji in partnership with Gujarat Water Infrastructure Limited uh, for the development of seawater desalination projects of 270 MLD uh, and through uh, hybrid model PPP on and DBOT. Uh, Mr. Kumar, we will go to him quite a bit uh, for experience on municipal projects. Uh, Mr. Solanki was supposed to be there, but he had to visit along with the Chief Minister a site. So Mr. Kumar is re effectively representing here not Shapurji Palanji, but Gujarat Water Infrastructure Board. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you probably had short notice, but thank you for being with us. Also with us is Dr. Sopnil Patil, uh, and he is uh, in a room. He's Deputy General Manager uh, at NTPC and has been involved with projects such as waste heat utilization by air conditioning, importantly, waste heat utilization for seawater desalination, uh, solar thermal seawater desalination and modeling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He's a chemical engineer by training and also has a PhD in design of multi phase stirred reactors. And I should mention uh, that. Uh, uh, that along with uh, uh, Dr. Shapnil, uh, we, he's in a room and he has his two colleagues, uh, including his boss, uh, who is uh, Mr. Shashtam, uh, who is a general manager at NTPC, and also his colleague Neeraj Goswami, who is also another deputy general manager at NTPC. So welcome, and also Mr. Shamil Bhattacharji, who is assistant general manager from NTPC. So there are four of them that we can see in the room. And uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen, and wonderful that all four of you could, could join us. And uh, also uh, with us is, uh, who has not yet joined us, he's going to join us in a short while because he had a meeting earlier, he's going to come in, is Mr. Abdul Rashid, who is consultant with State Industries Promotion Corporation of Tamil Nadu Limited. Uh, and uh, he is, um, yeah, and he's uh, uh, got about three and a half decades of experience, uh, water supply, sewage, etc. has worked with Chennai, uh, board for a while, is a civil engineer by training, and he'll be joining us, I think, at about 3.30. Uh, also with us is Mr. Nayan Shah, who is Sales Director of IDE Technologies. IDE Technologies is the one that's making this event possible. And I should mention, we have 188 people logged in right now. Uh, uh, he's worked in the chemical and water industry for over 20 years in various leadership positions, and he's uh, been deeply involved in water treatment uh, world, including membrane and thermal desalination technologies, also waste water treatment and water reuse solutions. Uh, welcome, Mr. Shah. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, to Mr. Shah, we'll also go for not just technology trends, but also global trends. Uh, we'll tap his expertise for that as well. Uh, also with us is uh, Mr. Ozad Sheikh, Associate Director, Economic Development Board, Government of Andhra Pradesh. And um, APDP works in areas such as IT, infrastructure, logistics, marine and industrial zone development. And he's responsible for investment promotion. And uh, one of the areas that they are looking at is desalination. And that's why Mr. Sheikh is here. Welcome, Mr. Sheikh. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. We'll have, we'll come to you for experience of SCZ, S, sort of given SCZ, an industrial park kind of perspective. And uh, finally, uh, we will have with us Mr. K.B. Suryam, who is a vice president and uh, uh, COE, uh, water and utilities at Reliance Industries, has got almost uh, four decades of experience of water management, generation and treatment uh, area uh, of uh, DM or whether it's DSAL, CW, BFW, 
uh, effluent treatment, recycling, et cetera, and working in areas like power, integrated steel plant, and now, of course, also large refinery and petrochemical complexes. He has a master's degree in chemistry, also has an MBA and a diploma in environment and ecology. Uh, real pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Surya. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you were all able to make it. Uh, so I think what we are going to do is, this is going to be fairly interactive. Uh, we have roughly about an hour uh, and five or 10 minutes for us. And I want to just make sure that I quickly have different questions for you. Uh, I'm just going to begin with Mr. Kumar. Mr. Kumar, could you tell us roughly um, the, uh, the, the projects in Gujarat? Uh, just sense of key features. Uh, we know it's 270 MLD, but uh, what, how many plants, uh, different capacities, uh, what's the technology you're using, and what's the economics of it? Yeah, good afternoon to all. Uh, uh, straight away, coming to the point, uh, the government of Gujarat has uh, decided to put up four numbers of treatment plants on the coastal side of Gujarat uh, with a capacity of 100 MLD in Kutch, uh, in Mandvi, and uh, a 70 MLD plant in Bhavnagar, and the 70 MLD, another plant in Dwaraga, and uh, the last one is the Gir Somanath, uh, which has got a capacity of 30 MLD. Uh, the, the, the technology used is, of course, the SWRO, the membrane processes, uh, with the sufficient pre-treatment prior to the, the, the the, the arrow. So this uh, particular, this project is a hybrid uh, model project like PPP. Uh, GWL is the authority uh, uh, who has uh, developed, uh, they have done a lot of research and they spent quite uh, a lot of time, what kind of technology will be used. Finally, they have decided and developed uh, a project uh, with accumulated capacity, I said earlier, the 270 capacity. Uh, uh, so this water produced will be utilized uh, mainly in the coastal areas because uh, Gujarat has a lot of water stress areas. Currently, uh, the water is getting from the, the, the Narmada uh, project, which is not sufficient to cater the other part. Uh, so GWL has got a you know, bulk uh, pipeline grid which is uh, spread over around uh, 3,000 kilometers to cater uh, various villages and various parts of Gujarat where water is a big, big problem. So to, to cater the future demands, uh, there will be a lot of water requirement. So the current 270 MLD will be adding up to the, the existing capacity. GWL is actually producing 1,600 MLD uh, per day, uh, MLD uh, using the you know the the Narmada canal and the associated canals. So the water produced from these uh, uh, the coastal desalination plants also will be also utilized in the coastal areas. Uh, the, the 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 current uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, there are multiple pumping which is again uh, adding the cost of the the the, the drinking water. So that is why the reason the government of Gujarat especially appointed GWL to look into uh, to the supply of uh, the, the drinking water through the, 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 the pipe grid actually they have built up earlier. So hoping that uh, uh, over the at least for the uh, five years to come, so we'll be adding this 270 MLD to, to cater uh, for the the current shortage of water, but again, you know, as the population increases or the industrial growth goes up, there will be a requirement of more water. And uh, the government is also <coughs> looking at some other areas also, if needed, uh, uh, there will be uh, another desalination plants will be coming up. The earlier plan was to start with the seven numbers uh, uh, and three numbers actually is currently on hold by increasing the capacity of the other, uh, other plants so that those water can be distributed to the areas. So, of course, uh, I think uh, the, the, the Gujarat government is one of the, 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 the state governments who has looked at this water scarcity problems. And of course, they have come up with a, a solution to 
you know, cater, especially the, the places like Kutch, you know, the, the water is a very, very problematic uh, affair there. So, uh, having said this, uh, the, the, the current systems of distribution uh, taken care by GWLB uh, will be getting after. We have a construction time of two years uh, after because the project has started in the initial stage. So, one year will be utilized for getting the approval, the statutory approvals. And once that is get, uh, so we'll be starting the construction. Uh, it will take two years to complete. And then this project is also uh, is coupled with the operation and maintenance for the next 25 years to come. So GWL along with the Shaporji Palwanji, we have a consortium. Uh, we have made up, uh, you know, SPVs. Uh, four SPVs has been you know, have been made to run uh, to manage the uh, uh, sorry the desalination plants uh, or a period of uh, 25 years. Uh, so that you know the, 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 the water problem will be addressed. As I said earlier, there will be more plants will be coming that are studies are going on. So it depends on the necessity or the requirements. Again, GWL will be uh, coming up with uh, you know, the, the, the findings because uh, DPR has been uh, made very at the earlier stage. So they know, so we know that uh, where are the, you know, the pockets we need to concentrate more. So that the water problems uh, can be can be can be you know, addressed and managed uh, well. That's Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Of course, we'll come back to you for for questions, uh, yeah. Dr. Kilkar. If I can ask you a very brief question, uh, right now with all the plans uh, that are there, uh, what is the total municipal capacity under development uh, or already operational municipal capacity? Um, I think. Uh, I could be wrong, but somewhere around about 800 uh, MLD. And, and what is the, and in the pipeline? The, in the right. pipeline, the currents. I think um, uh, Gujarat has some. Uh, right. I'm not talking small ones, 10 MLD right. and 5 right. MLD. I'm just right. using large right. scale. Right. Right. Chennai has two. The third one is under construction. The fourth one will come another three, four years. That is 450. So that's 450 plus 3, 750 plus uh, around 200. So about 1,000 MLD, uh, roughly in next five years. Okay. Uh, let me ask my colleague Nikita Chavra, uh, who's a researcher on our end. Uh, Nikita, uh, is there roughly the numbers that we are tracking? How are they? Yeah, yeah. Almost the same. Almost the same. Okay. Let me go to Mr. Shah. Mr. Shah, Hello. Hello. Yeah. It's our bread and butter, so we need to know how many plants are coming, aren't yes, they? Of course, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And we charge much less than you, so we are, we are, we can be more inaccurate than you are. You know? So, uh, Mr. Shah, any comments on the viability of uh, uh, desalination for municipal uses? So, when when we talk about viability, we always figure out the price. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be the right price for the water is always a question, and it's not today, but it's since long. Right. Now, majority of the development fails when, when you look at the price as a factor to decide whether to go for or not. Mm -hmm. Generally, when you initiate something, you always start getting better. If you talk right. about the desalination as a history, again, you know, the power trend, uh, Dr. Kilker already explained, and uh, right. also the price of a membrane and the throughput out of a membrane is all right. only going to get better. Okay. But so, uh, in the newer plants, if, if anyone is looking at it now and wondering whether, uh, let's say, they should be setting up a plant in, let's say, Kerala, for example, right, or Karnataka, uh, yeah. what kind of cost are they looking at? So, it, it's less than, less than a dollar. Okay. Right? But if you see the global trends versus this figure, if you try to match this, you will see the disconnect, okay. right? Why? Because global trends are even much lower than half a dollar. Okay. Why we are talking about this? And why is it higher for us? Yeah, so the problem lies into the forex. A, B okay. is like the what is the power cost? Okay. C is like what kind of tenure are we looking at? Four right. is what kind of input water quality you do have? Okay. So how far I to go in to draw water? Okay. And uh, what is my associated the power and other generation? As again, I take a clue from Dr. Kilker's presentation is like the hybrid usage of a power. Okay, right. Got it. Right. Yeah. just one very quick 10 second question for you before I go to Mr. Suryam. Uh, in, 
are, are companies like yours, whether it's you or any other company, uh, willing to do a almost like a PPA kind of thing, like not a water purchase agreement, or or do you simply sell capex? No. So PPP or uh, hybrid model or uh, you know the that that is more uh, easy. Okay. And uh, that is where the you know the developer has a lesser risk, and right. uh, it's it's like the long tenure. So. The water cost also can be brought down. Okay, so by, by PPP you mean annuity, or do you mean, uh, or do you mean you are selling the water at a particular cost? It's like the water purchase agreement. Water purchase. The power what we do very okay. comfortably okay. in India. I, so that's good. Yeah. So that's what we can do. So there is a model here that we have uh, to follow uh, from the power sector. Okay. Uh, let me go to Mr. Suryam first. Uh, Mr. Suryam, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Tell us. Uh, uh, in your empire, so to say, uh, what is your what is the desalination uh, uh, province of your empire? So we when uh, Jamnagar first refinery was started somewhere around uh, <coughs> sorry 2000 and, uh, 1997, we went with thermal desalination. It was about uh, 60 MLD capacity. At that time, I think RO plants were not that popular. If they were energy intensive and the Reliability was a major issue at that time. And uh, J2, which we call it JERP, that was around 2005 when we doubled the capacity of the refining capacity. We went ahead with 100 MLD thermal desalination again. And both uh, thermal desal plants were supplied by ID. Now, when we started J3 projects, which is another uh, $20 billion uh, investment, it's uh, mostly C2 complex and uh, pet coke uh, gasification. At that time, there was a debate. In fact, I had published a white paper at that time, why thermal and why not RO? And in the entire company, there was a very good debate. We visited Israel and saw many of their IDE plants. And finally, it is uh, it went uh, in favor of the uh, reverse osmosis, mainly on two counts. One is definitely the OPEX part. Thermal digital to load uh, steam cost at around 1200 tons, uh, 1200 rupees per ton or so. But then the thermal diesel water costs you somewhere around 130 to 150 rupees per cubic meter. As against that, uh, the RO plant water costs hardly 25 to 30 rupees, 25 rupees roughly. I'm talking only OPEX without loading the CAPEX part or the life cycle costs. <clears throat> so at that time we went ahead with uh, in J3 projects, we went ahead with uh, uh, RO plant and the capacity is close to 200 MLD, 8,000 cubic meters uh, per hour. And along with that, because we had waste steam in this overall steam balance, we also installed uh, 3,000 cubic meter per hour uh, thermal desalination plant, 1,000 cubic meter per hour, three units. So overall installed capacity at Jamnagar alone is around 420 MLD desalination and another 60 MLD or so we have recycling RO plants. All our effluent treatment plants have got recycling RO plants at the downstream of the effluent and we recover almost 80% of the water from the entire effluent water is generated in the complex and these effluents are of very complex nature be it gasification with heavy metals and very high COD oil and grease so we treat it to almost less than 50 COD and then recycle the entire, uh, almost 80% of the water back to the cooling towers. At all other sites also, we have got effluent treatment plants. RO plant, as our uh, friend from Mr. Mano just told in the Gujarat belt, the hedge we have and Surat, uh, we have uh, Hajira, we are petrochemical complexes. We are working on it, but uh, if you see the cost of fresh water versus RO water, I feel in next four to five years, as the freshwater costs are increasing, for industries, freshwater costs are increasing at the rate of 10% every year. After four years or so, the freshwater cost will be almost 45 to 50 rupees after uh, pretreatment and uh, clarification and pretreatment. Whereas RO water will be more or less in that range if we install on our own. If somebody install, else installs and sells us water, then it will be around 50 to 60 rupees, I guess. So that is the perspective. Uh, all right. Uh, Mr. Shah, any comments on the technology they're using? And So, 
Mr. Suryam already mentioned about the footprint uh, at Reliance on the thermal, and uh, it's it's a refinery. Unlike a municipal plant, they have the waste steam or the very low quality steam available. So that was a very you know synergistic to use a thermal as a solution. And as you mentioned, the cost uh, versus the reliability. So the thermal units are very reliable, and uh, downtime is almost negligible. And even the skill set required to operate is also, you know, compared to RO is less complicated. Okay. So that's one. And second, RO in last uh, 15 years, it's getting more popular because of the know-how and the sheer uh, acceptability across, you know, the, across the capacities. So it's, it's like uh, most popular and uh, unless there is a specific reason like uh, the low cost team or otherwise, the RO is or SWRO is the most preferred desalination technology currently. Okay. Mr. Suryam, uh, what are the uh, big issues and challenges that you see? Uh, and related to that, what, did, what do you wish the technology providers or the contractors did better? Uh, where do they fall short? So first and the foremost requirement is the reliability of the on 24 by 7, particularly if you are operating such a large capacity refinery and petrochemical complex or uh, reliability has to be a 24 by 7 basis. So when we were installing RO plant, this was a very big question which I had to answer uh, across the organization top to bottom that reliability will be of a highest order with SWRO as well as compared to thermal diesel. So given the capex and opex, so we went ahead with uh, RO. Now the first question asked was uh, what will be the or, uh, operation uh, skills that are available with us, whether we can develop. That confidence also was given. But yes, as far as uh, reliability of operations of thermal and RO are concerned, thermal are much easier. And RO plants requires, uh, is a sensitive area RO. And people talk too much on uh, membranes and we went ahead with ultrafiltration also. So where people talk too much on ultrafiltration as well as RO membranes, but I say 95%, 90 to 95% of the reliability of RO plant or any water treatment plant comes from the pre-treatment. And that's not a fancy area. So I think people are not that fancy about it and it generally get neglected. So that's the area where we had given maximum focus. And it's almost three years now that we are operating RO and thermal, of course, more than 20 years now. Okay. Uh, we'll now go to NTPC, uh, and uh, we, there are four people. Uh, there's uh, Dr. Uh, Patil, uh, there is uh, Mr. Uh, Sheswatam, uh, Mr. Bhattacharji, and Mr. Goswami as well. Uh, could you tell us, sir, uh, what has been the NTPC experience in terms of how many plants do you have right now? What kind of technology is it using? Uh, how much is it costing? What are your thoughts on the next plants uh, that you're planning? Go ahead, sir. Sir, we can uh, we can't hear you very well, so we'll have to be closer to wherever the mic is placed. Uh, not as well, sir. So you'll have to be maybe either speak louder or get get it closer. So I'm not sure what the issue is. Yeah, this is better where you are, sir. I can almost, I can hear you sitting down, so that means I have I to really re look at myself. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So the, let me divide my response into two parts. What NTPC has done, and the second part, uh, what is our thought, and uh, which direction we intend to move. The first thing uh, in what we have done, that is the thing. So we are a uh, power producer, the largest power producer in this country. So our idea was how to find synergy between the power and, and uh, water. So the thought uh, went like this, that in any coal-fired plant, say the typical size of 5 million megawatt, so we release blue gas uh, where the energy content is almost 30 to 40 megawatt, and uh, which can easily translate to a water generation of around 6 to 10 MLD. So, and then this energy is free. Okay, so, so our first venture was how to uh, leverage this free energy and to produce very high quality water 
at a very low low cost. So that first plant was designed uh, one lakh twenty thousand liter plant per day uh, at uh, Simadri plant that is near Sakapatnam. The second in initiative was the solar thermal desalination, and solar thermal is of uh, uh, very new variety. So it uh, packs all the features of solar PV, which has got, uh, which has gained ground uh, over the years. Uh, but then the solar thermal, with all the attributes of solar PV, and then that is coupled with a desalination plant. So once again, one lakh twenty thousand liters per day. That is uh, set up at Balur, uh, outskirts of Chennai. So, so this is the uh, two things we have done. The on our drive drawing board is the forward osmosis. And uh, we are about to roll out both the variants, the non-thermal one and the thermal. So this is a thing which is done uh, at this point of time. What is our thought? The thought goes like this: that uh, the cost of, there is no true debate uh, that uh, uh, drinking water is required uh, right across this country, more so in the uh, coastal regions. So how to produce water at a minimal cost? A lot of cost numbers were mentioned. For a thermal, 150 rupees per ton uh, to around 50, 60 rupees uh, for the RO. So our idea is how to drive down the cost, and uh, from that, uh, the thing what we have uh, figured out that if you if we take this free energy source of the flue gas, which is coming out from so many plants, then uh, that energy is is next to zero cost. That is first point. Second point: see see water is anyway coming to this power plant. So the complete infrastructure to bring the water, to tap the sea water, that is also taken care. So if we couple these two, to, uh, two things and build the technology, then the cost of water will be very attractive. So this is r and center, probably we not like to talk into the cost, actual cost, but then very, very attractive. So people are talking about 40 rupees, so it is going to be less than 20 rupees also. So, the, so because of two, these two very obvious reasons. So we are, uh, so that is our thought and we are going full, uh, full uh, this thing uh, in this direction. The other point is, uh, this is the thermal uh, desalination and the variant is that is the MED. Uh, that is a very common MED, but it will, this type of MED will look very different because we are generating steam from flue gas. And then that is ultra low pressure steam. So specific volume is very large. So the, in look wise, the MED will look very different, but then that technology remains same, same polyfilm reactor, same MED. Thus, this is our uh, first uh, effort and we are going in a big way in this direction. The second thing is uh, the forward osmosis, which can uh, recover water uh, to the extent of 90%, 95%. Now this also has two variants, one the non-thermal and uh, other the thermal. So we are doing both. Uh, non-thermal, where uh, probably we don't have the coal based plant or uh, uh, the flue gas availability is limited, and the thermal variant, where it can be coupled with a gas based plant or a coal based plant, so there we can uh, make use of the free free heat and once again uh, produce this water. So, so these these things also we are doing. The third thing which we have not done yet, but then our other arm is already working. That is the MSW. Now, MSW is also becoming a very big thing and several things have been talked, but that all this MSW plant can be converted to hydrogen, to different, different things. So one of the things also can be very attractive proportion. Somebody talked about uh, multiple generation. So, so same starting with MSW and hooking up uh, this uh, uh, thermal desalination from that with power or without power. So these three things uh, that is in our radar, and we believe that this will have a good future. So RO will continue to continue to remain. It, it will have its own place. But then uh, we think that if it builds energy, then this will this, this might be the way to go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Shah. Any any comment you have on what NTPC is doing or what could be appropriate for power plants uh, uh, which are based in coastal areas? So I, I agree on the solar usage to, you know, the harness, the solar energy is the definite good thought. Combining with the desalination in a single step could be, you know, really innovative. But uh, we see the globally also, it's like the IPP or the independent solar power uh, plants are the trend. 
One is to have the similar life we expect from a solar uh, power and the desalination plant. So it brings down the cost or at least in the control of a developer and uh, it, it helps uh, bringing down the cost. So that's, that's one. And uh, the innovative RO approach is, of course, uh, something which is uh, interesting to understand. And uh, it's, it's like early to comment in terms of commercialization. But that's, that's the interesting trend. Uh, and we're going to come back uh, again to have a discussion. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, if you could tell us what is uh, you know, uh, happening in Andhra Pradesh and what is your organization doing uh, and uh, what are its plans? Hello, everyone. Yes, sir. Hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure uh, more than me, Mr. Shah would be able to tell about uh, Andhra Pradesh and uh, desalination business in Andhra Pradesh. But yes, on the contrary, I just uh, give you an overview. What is he had a, a meeting with our Honorable Chief Minister. Uh, on uh, after the successful completion of uh, one year in this current leadership, uh, after that, yes, that need to die. sir, we lost you a little bit there. If you can repeat so, that, yeah. so our current chief minister, uh. He's, he's keen on just, you know, uh, developing the infrastructure in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Yeah. Precisely uh, at advanced stage of... Yeah. Mr. Sheikh, if I can, if you can perhaps switch off the video. Technologies. Yeah. Mr. Sheikh, Mr. Sheikh, if you can switch off the video while you are talking, it might be a bandwidth issue. If you can switch off the video, that way we'll be able to hear you better. Yes. Let's try that, sir. Up at least uh, 100 MLD. I'm, I'm just trying the way you told me. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just trying the way you told me. Yes, sir. Now I'm audible? Yes, sir. You are. You're audible, sir. You're audible, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, we have, we have definitely government of Andhra Pradesh is keen on developing this, uh, desalination. So this is one of our focus area. So, uh, in this regard, we have been talking to multiple operators or multiple developers in which, uh, the foremost important, uh, developer or maybe the support system is ID technologies only. So we are, uh, I think, uh, I'm sure I, I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, our Honorable Chief Minister, when he had visited to Israel, he had visited ID Technologies uh, unit as well. So then looking at the technology and then uh, the, the capabilities, then he wanted to set up such type of facility in the Andhra Pradesh, uh, towards the north of Andhra Pradesh, that is Vishakapatnam, where the major industrial activity is also taking place. And uh, the reason behind uh, having this setup of uh, Vishakapatnam uh, is, uh, you know, there are several reasons. One is like uh, Government of India's initiative, Vishakapatnam Chennai Industrial Corridor. So where a lot of industry is going to come up there. So for them, this will be of a great use of this desalinated water. And secondly, uh, there, are, uh, there are almost about 450 to 500 industrial parks are in Andhra Pradesh. So it, it will be easier for us to just, you know, uh, feed the industrial requirement from the Vishakapatnam. So third is uh, like, you know, we are also in a, in a, in a pipeline to develop about uh, 200 numbers of uh, MSME parks in Andhra Pradesh. So now in this pandemic situation, MSME being the major focus by government of India, on the same lines, we at the government of Andhra Pradesh is also just, you know, going by the same targeted uh, audiences or maybe the economic activities, what we call it. So uh, definitely there's, you know, there is, there is, there is need of uh, Northern Zone. The current demand is like about 850 
MLD and projected about uh, thousand MLD from the down the line about ten years from now. So likewise, uh, cumulative. If you see, uh, there is there is definitely a need of about uh, uh, two thousand MLD of uh, uh, water is needed in the state of Andhra Pradesh. So this hundred is just a start, I can say. Okay, uh, and. Uh... Uh, what is the model that you are looking at uh, in terms of that internet? modality is something which we are discussing mm -hmm. uh, but foremost our honorable chief minister has positively nodded on setting up of a spv on this specifically on the proposed water uh, mm -hmm. desalination so inclusive of uh, industries department and irrigation department and also the panchayat raj department and department uh, we wanted to form an spv uh, with the layer uh, okay okay uh, mr shah private player whom server is there on this uh, okay. i'm sure we will be able to just find the last okay uh, mr shah uh, what makes this project from your point of view an interesting project so one is if you see the yes, maybe, uh, with the player or maybe the private player owner we will be able to just find it as soon yes sir yeah thank you mr sheik thank you we are asking mr shah to comment on your project now mr shah yeah so it's yes, it's please. like the desalination is very core to our capabilities a b is like the andhra if you see it's like the long coast and a very it's just like a start up state so it's like the they are the building the infrastructure from the core and the vision in the head governs the body so it's it's like we are working on this project since long and uh, the recent uh, developments in the state like the last one year it's it's like the desalination is viewed as the welfare project in terms of the sustainability and the drinking water because vaisagi is witnessing the large development and uh, is like we can we can see the the more migration to our vaisag so even the population of the city and all is looking so there were a detailed feasibility study been done by us and uh, it's like we discuss with the various stakeholder in the state and uh, head governs the body at the end of the day there should be political will to do this and desalination doesn't co uh, comes cheap so at the end of the day we have to see that uh, whatever is the vision is we should able to you know make it work and uh, it's it to work for our uh, customer so that is uh, that's that's no brainer actually for us to invest into it and uh, we in india started our operations since 2008 so we are pretty grounded on this uh, subject in india as we said there are close to 400 uh, mld of the dcl we built at reliance and uh, and uh, close to 100 mld at other places so okay okay it's like Let yeah let me let me go to dr kelkar dr kelkar uh, i understand that uh, economics is all relative uh, it's always a cost of you know what is desalinated what are going to cost versus a fresh water uh, but even then uh, is there a size thing is there a minimum requirement uh, that a municipality has to have uh, or an industrial park uh, or the industrial park is a little different let's say uh, uh, small uh, what, what's the size uh, minimum is there a minimum size that a municipality has to have in terms of a plant size for it to make sense um i don't think there is a size specific limitation there is a cost specific limitation so i mean for example i'll i'll put your question a little bit differently right uh take an example of hyderabad or take an example of bangalore their fresh water resources what they are bringing into mm -hmm. into the process are roughly about 60 to 70 rupees per kiloliter that's right. a fresh water getting pumped treated and used versus if 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 that is the case in for example in chennai where you have the water availability due to sea coastline is there the water bringing from long distances are not possible or it's it's difficult then 40 rupees per kiloliter becomes much more viable there right or if you take other side let's say we have a good public awareness campaign and we prove that the water coming through this reservoirs and natural processes is 60 rupees and the recycle and reuse through the ro process is only 40 rupees per kiloliter then which is there to do so size has not the issue the directly usage of the water is the issue and the second foremost situation is none of the cities in india i'm talking about i'm talking about ulbs none of the ulbs in india are uh, close to what you say is full cost recovery model 
they don't get exact the full cost of what their cost of produced water is. It's always subsidized against the full cost to be recovered from the industries. And that is the reason most of the industries are moving into zero liquid discharge, again, to safeguard their own cost processes. And then now there's this burdening on the cities. Unless we have a full cost recovery or close to full cost recovery, I think then there will be much better questions answered. Obviously, there will be people who will not be able to pay. So it needs to be devised up in such a way that whosoever pays higher or usage is higher, pays higher. And that's how the cost recovery will be there. And that the, then the cost of whether it's a desal versus natural versus RO will come into picture most effectively. Okay. Uh, let me ask Mr. Shah one question. Is there an economy of scale here? I mean, uh, is, is 100 MLD cost, uh, uh, how much is it versus a 40 MLD cost? Mr. Shah? Yeah, so I'll give you a ballpark. Like it's it's like for building a one MLD of a desalination, mm -hmm. you goes to invest around eight to ten crores, okay. right? And uh, the forty MLD is of course you know you require to draw a line from a sea and you again send back your outfall. Sure. So that infrastructure costs more, you know, because for the smaller right. pipeline also you need to do the similar study of the sea like bathymetry and others. Right. Also the construction portion, the complexity on the design. So right. the overheads are heavy, but it is not uh, something which is if you need 40 MLD, you'll not put up 100 MLD just because of the cost advantage. So the compelling need is the one which is driving factor. Okay. And uh, beyond 100 MLD, again, the complexity is again very high. So, okay. you know, you, you have yeah. to figure that out. Okay. Mr. Suryam, if I can come to you, uh, when you look at the different technologies, uh, uh, developments that are going on in the world, and Dr. Kilker referred to some of those, uh, in terms of technology development, in terms of cost, what, what is the one aspect that you find very interesting or very appealing or one or two aspects, you know? Uh, is yeah, it uh, in fact, uh, when Vaijag was being referred, I was the first person there. I was a DGM and head of water management in steel plant, along okay. with municipal corporation and everyone. We worked on the desalination in 2000. But of course, it never took place from there onwards. <laughs> But yes, for, as far as diesel is concerned, we I traveled a lot, uh, particularly Israel and other countries also. And I find that there are a couple of technologies where you can, can convert to seawater. One mm -hmm. is definitely thermal desalination, has got MED, multi effect distillation, or multi stage flash, etc. Then you have got uh, RO plants. Within RO, you have again, people talk of forward osmosis <coughs> or closed circuit. Uh, desalination CCD but closed circuit desalination uh, got uh, limited uh, uses it did not develop further what it was uh, about uh, 10 years back or so mm -hmm. but yes one technology I feel will be the um, taking shape in next couple of years is the solar based thermal desalination and that will be not RO but it will be thermal in a sense that concentrated uh, solar energy will be focused on the uh, water heating the water and generating vapors and there is a technology called membrane distillation in fact we had a couple of presentations from membrane distillation people called particularly Mem memesis i think was the company but yes a lot of work has to be done still in the in that area of membrane distillation but as far as ro is concerned uh, it is uh, uh, reaching a stage of maturation um, uh, with respect to energy with respect to membranes etc Hardly we'll see any major breakthroughs in a way. Energy recovery is also at its highest now. Uh, Mr. Shah, what are the exciting global trends? Uh, do we have a Moore's law kind of situation here or a solar panel kind of situation? So the world is moving to the larger plants. So we are happy to announce uh, and uh, to the larger group here is like very recently we've been awarded the SOREC 2. Again, the this is again one of the largest Israel desalination plant, just got awarded three days back. And uh, it's, uh, again, you know, it's, it's look like how we can reduce the cost per meter cube. So right. if you talk about earlier, we were around 0.6 dollar a meter cube. Now it has reduced to 0.41. So one is a large size. What are the other trends that you're seeing globally? Another trend is like the designing innovation, which is like the specific energy per meter cube. Mm -hmm. which is again uh, boils down to cost because right. ultimately you need to produce water at least a price. Right. So some of the design innovations were IDE pioneered and uh, 
it's a core to our uh, culture you must say is like uh, the lesser footprint because the coast are the one where the larger development is if right. you take so much of space building the large plants it's it's not going to happen right. if you move a little away from the coast then uh, you know the laying the pipeline would be more challenging so then the pipe jacking and other technology you use or you use the larger size of the membranes so right. these are the things we yep. always keep innovating okay yeah. let me go back to mr surya mr surya uh, you talked about solar uh, uh, powered or solar thermal uh, you know desalination uh, is that uh, uh, simply more environment friendly or is it also what is the cost compared to the conventional Uh, no idea but as far as solar energy is concerned is simply coupling of uh, solar power to our ro plant and the night backup will be through the batteries only okay so is okay. instead of a regular power supply it will be solar power supply but as i told membrane distillation definitely it will be a breakthrough achievement as far as solar energy is concerned but yes cost wise i don't have much idea on that dr kelkar any comments yeah. on the cost comparison Honestly, cost for ROs, as uh, Surya Mishra has said, that it has reached its peak right now. Um, unless we develop something with um, solar, solar with distillation, and FO, that is the forward osmosis. Unless forward osmosis, the solvent becomes very easy to use for drinking water purposes. I think the water cost will go down and down. But otherwise, uh, it's going to remain somewhere close to less than. Uh, 60 cents per dollar i mean 60 cents per meter cube in somewhere in that neighborhood okay uh, if i can go to mr kumar mr kumar what are the challenges of doing municipal projects uh, is it pretty much the same as doing the project for reliance or is it different and what are the differences if any mr kumar you ask me to manoj kumar yes sir actually this current project is uh, mainly for the 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 drinking water for the the villages mm -hmm. uh, and also for the the, the industrial areas where uh, water is uh, required for the industrial purpose mm -hmm. so, so it depends you know uh, the growth of the industry as well uh, mm -hmm. for example in bhavnagar is a industrial you know place where more industries are coming up so this uh, the, the requirement of the, the water usage for the industries is to be in a considered uh, you know again during a study but the current the the emphasis is to give the water to the public to the villagers or where the people are you know looking for more water so that is the the, the important we are giving for this especially with this and and are our municipalities able to uh, bear the cost or do they pass it on to the consumers how does that work how was acceptability of this acceptability is actually uh you become definitely they have to absorb the cost you know, because you know if if government is going to give more you know the the funds uh, or uh, or you know the support for the, uh, the the capex for the project of course the, the the price is going to be reduced that's how we this project also you know there's 40% it is uh, 40% of the capex is going to be funded by the the, the state government so relatively the water charges will be less so that is the the area so we 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 are looking at uh, after considering the current four projects so where are the uh, the, the most uh, you know the, the demand is coming up from the the, the state of uh, you know gujarat that's what we are looking at but the current project is a is a combination but it is the, the preference is give to uh, is giving to the, the drinking water side Okay, uh, Dr. Patil, uh, if I can ask you the question about the solar part as well, uh, because you mentioned that you you are looking at solar, uh, you know, uh, use of solar thermal or solar powered. Uh, what is the economics of that sir? versus versus the more conventional energy source? Yeah, Dr. Excuse Patil, me, can you come again, please? Yeah, Dr. Patil, you said you were looking at a use of solar. uh as well what is the yeah. what will be the cost comparison of that versus a conventional energy source it will be almost what see this is small plant 1 lakh 20 thousand liters right so comparing one is to one it will be almost uh, 30% extra 
Thirty percent extra. Okay, all right. So your primary driver is what? Is it being environmentally friendly, or is it because you want to reduce the carbon footprint? I mean, what is your primary driver here? The primary driver is to develop a bouquet of technologies. One which can be hooked up with power plant. Other where the power plant is not existing, then what can be the solution? So, so we are we are developing a bouquet of technologies. Okay, uh, Dr. Patil, uh, are there any? Uh, uh norms uh, by pollution control board or by crc i mean who has the norms in this regard for water consumption uh, especially coastal plants see as far as uh, whatever happens within the power plant that is in the ambit of crc okay so so they prescribe how much water has to be used and there's these norms gets uh, revised frequently so we have to comply with those norms okay so uh, dr kilkar were you going to say something no no i'm just answering some questions that i saw that's you, why i knew that's why i muted myself <laughs> okay all right okay. only one point yeah uh, hello one yes, point yes gujarat particularly the hej area where uh, lnt is installing this 100 mld plant right the biggest challenge is how to deal with this sludge there the suspended okay. solids are somewhere around 2000 ppm which is a virtually a slurry what we get in the sea okay. unlike other coasts where the suspended solids are hardly 20 ppm or so so okay. daily you will be generating some almost 2000 tons of uh, wet cake from the hmm. uh, clarification of uh, sea water so that disposal is definitely a very big challenge and if you install uh, something like uh, belt filter press for that or operators or crystallizers i mean not crystallizers you dry dry solids dryers etc then ultimately where do you dispose this sludge or wet cake disposal itself requires lot of land and if we want to dispose of this slurry or the suspended solids it will be somewhere around in the return brine somewhere around 3000 ppm and environmentally it is not being allowed i think a concession is required in this area a pure sludge which has been taken out from the sea will be sent back to the sea without any chemicals then the plants will be quite uh, viable okay. otherwise it will be a very tough task to deal with this sludge okay uh, any comments on that mr shah dealing with the sludge no no we are part of the same boat it's like uh, that's something which is technologically very challenging and uh, it's like either you go to the deep sea which is also the area like the hage is not different to water there is no blue sea available so this is uh, we are also exploring the right technical solution to it there is one plant is already being constructed by lnt as uh, suryam sir said it's it's like uh, being a government plant if they give some concession in terms of mixing it with uh, the outfall and uh, but it should be available to others as well i agree and it's a uh, without uh, chemical if you if you don't alter the morphology of the soil or this uh, sludge i i think it can be allowed but it's again a question large question to a controlling okay. bodies we are we are now going to take the questions uh, from the audience and there are quite a few so this will be sort of rapid fire a little bit so short answers please uh, and i'll try to move through the questions fast as well this is from an anonymous attendee no question that desalination is important in the future but how sustainable uh is the technology uh, in terms of its reliance on energy consumption power production and effective reuse of the brine effluent how effectively are we moving towards the un sdg 6 goal uh dr kelkar any comments on that i think it is going to be an effective it's one of the alternatives uh, in your hand it's not the alternative it's one of the alternative i don't think there will be any issue with respect to not meeting the sdg 6 um okay. brine Yes, it will create an issue. Uh, brine is still being worked out. Uh, people are doing a lot of research on brine recycling and reuse and so forth. But there's always a limit that you can push it to a certain level. It can't go beyond that. But uh, till then, I think that's how it's going to be. Okay. Next question uh, is from anonymous attendee. Does not give the name. Uh, I'll send it to Mr. Shah. Uh, dispersion modeling of far field transport is important, but the initial dilution of the effluent takes in the near field. takes place in the near field i'm assuming and the intermediate field of mixing that is 500 meters around the source point that's where it takes place so do we adopt initial dilution mixing in the design of marine outfall system 
Yeah, so it depends. It, again, see, when you have the large power plant, they have the one through system and all the natural stream is available. You dilute right at the plant and send it in the sea. Otherwise, uh, you do it where you have the larger installation would be better. And uh, you might invest more money in terms of laying a pipe, but it is easy to monitor, easy to control. And uh, in terms of the downstream op operating would be easier. So the modeling can be viewed in this both the aspects. Detail analysis can be done with the real numbers, but yes, the, with okay. the limited information, this would be answered. Okay. The next session, uh, question is for Dr. Kelkar. What, in your opinion, is the potential for treated wastewater reuse market for all portable and non-portable uses? Um, the market is there. It's like, um, it's like uh, technology is available. But what is not there is the public awareness campaign. And I always like to give this example whenever I can. We all drink this bottled water. We drink it because it has got a name on it, but whosoever name it is, because we are confident about it. But we don't know where this water has been drawn, what close to the treatment plant or, or, or what level of groundwater. So it, it's, it's you put it there, people will come, you show the water quality in front, you show the details, maybe have to work for harder for a year to give the data. And I think it's in forefront that water is also available. And, and, and people have moved from not accepting to accepting. For example, take an example of the US and other places where they were not saying no toilet to tap. Now there are plans being built for IPR, indirect portable reuse, or DPR, direct portable use. US EPA, like others, Israel also included, have come up with a lot of regulations and restrictions and operations. And they're doing, they're saving the water, they're using it. It's just a matter of time that we will take it and take it further. Okay. Uh, the next question I'm going to direct to Mr. Suryam, uh, if he can answer that. What is the benchmark for cooling tower based RO chemical treatment, brackish water RO cost per cubic meter? Sir, if you can unmute yourself, Mr. Suryam. Brackish water RO definitely it is a, a river water where the TDS will be or deep well water where the TDS will be about uh, 1000 to 3000 ppm. Thus, the conversion cost to OPEX will be somewhere around 15 rupees or so. Okay. When you say OPEX, it includes uh, power, chemicals, and membrane replacement once in three, four, or five years. Okay. So 15 rupees is the conversion cost. Okay. The cooling tower blowdown recycling through RO is uh, quite difficult because it has got a lot of calcium, magnesium, and silica. So I am also struggling in that. Okay. Uh, my next question I will send to Mr. Shah. Mr. Shah, this is from Hari Prasad Cherukpalli. What should be the starting point for having a D cell plant? And he means the ideal location, how far from the coastline? Uh, and, uh, and also, what is a good size to start uh, within, an, within an industrial area that is being developed? Uh, uh, 10 to 15 years to get populated, say 4,000 acres. So maybe you can answer the first question first. Ideal location, how far from the coastline? So if it's as, as closer to the coast is the answer, but okay. as I said, many times that choice is not available. So okay. you're, you're Let me ask you have to look the analysis. Yeah. So what is the farthest that we have a cell and a desalination plant right now in uh, India? Two kilometers, two and a half kilometers. Okay, Sometimes. all right. Yeah. All right. Even, even uh, question for Mr. Manoj Mar Kumar from the same gentleman. Uh, what are the models for diesel plant working in India? Paper use, government investment, or PPP? Mr. Kumar? Uh, I would say PPP is the best model. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Sanjay Kumar, and he wants to know uh, uh, uses of scale ban in desalination for recycling of effluent. What will be the feasibility of that? Uh, Mr. Shah, do you want to take a crack at that? I, I don't have uh, any answer to that. Uh, you know, the track record. So, okay. so Mr. Suryam, Mr. Suryam. Yeah, in fact, scale ban had approached us many times. Okay. Might be working in some cases, but definitely the moment you take out calcium magnesium from the water into a colloidal suspension, mm -hmm. and given the chlorides and uh, the softness of the water, the water becomes highly corrosive. Right. For, uh, to take care of that corrosion, either you need to have a super duplex or duplex type of metallurgy or those enormous amount of molybdate as a corrosion inhibitor. The cost for us actually went very high. So we not, did not attempt any installation of uh, scale ban in our areas. Okay. Uh, there's a comment from Mr. Michael Tremor. He says the SOREC2 plant in Israel is 570 MLD and the cost of water is 
30 rupees uh, per cubic meter uh, all 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 in uh, next question from gulam mustafa i'll go to dr kelkar for that what is what are the pcbc norm pcpb norms and pollution control board norms for discharge of brine in the sea in terms of solids and salinity I think it it will change from uh, country to country. It will so, change uh, from area specific. But uh, pollution uh, control board in India, Mr. Shah, yeah, do you have? It, sorry, I I didn't understood the question. Uh, what is the pollution control board norms for discharge of brine in the sea in terms of salinity and salinity? Salinity, there is no limit. It in a way, it's like uh, you recover your uh, water, like let's say forty or forty-two percent of the recovery. Mm -hmm. So the salinity, that's not a problem. It's uh, feasible to go in, mm -hmm. but there is always the limitation on the suspended solids, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's where the whole uh, challenge is in terms of the treatability. So you you already yeah. remove the suspended solids part of pretreatment before sending it to SWRO. So the sludge is already taken out. So, so there's, there's a related question from Kanika Basal. How much percentage of brine is generated from MED or thermal process in comparison to SWRO? The same. Both are same. Recoveries are around forty percent. Okay. So uh, both the discharges are same, more or less. Okay. Uh, this is a general question. Maybe Dr. Kelkar will have an answer. As sugar, uh, from Sanjay Bhagat, he wants to know: sugar industry is, is producing water. Is there any other industry doing the same? Dr. Kelkar. Can you, yeah. Can you repeat that? I would just. He says the sugar industry is uh, producing water. Is there any industry doing the same? Um. I, not aware producing water in what respect in the sense yeah so um, are they re are they yeah, regenerating yeah. the water and using it for themselves or or because most of the industries are doing in the zero, zero liquid discharge anyway they are generating water for themselves so i think i'll ask the gentleman to clarify that from harendra kumar patak now uh, how do you deal with sludge return after treatment return to c maybe mr suryam since he talked about about this sludge there as i told earlier also it's very difficult to treat this sludge or uh, make it moisture free and dispose on land so brine return along with brine only in majority of the plants it is being done worldwide okay uh, question from reena jinde can dr kelkar explain how we can optimize the design of intake system i don't know whether you can I do think that I think I think the design will depend upon the site location, where it is, what type of design, what type of systems you want to utilize. How is the uh, microbial contained in the sea in that part of the area? What are the seasonal variations? So it, it's not one size fits all. Um, I think you have to do a design analysis, and that's how a lot of work is done, typically okay. by marine scientists and marine systems. So okay, uh, yeah, I can't give you that answer. Once one size fits all. I know. Okay, Mr. Suryam. Uh, Uh, again the sludge return the person has a follow up question can this return uh, does this return happen by pipeline or open channel it's a pipeline only sludge return has to be pipeline and uh, intake can be through a open channel which jamnagar we have but okay. sludge return has to be through pipeline only okay question uh, for maybe dr kelkar uh, use of recycled water after covid 19 is under review what are your thoughts on the issue Um, I think you you are you are you are reviewing or you are reading the document a little bit differently what has been shown in the readout in the literature in the research that people have found the rna of the covid-19 virus it has not been proven it has not been shown very clearly that the virus is susceptible for contagious systems through that what they are saying is yes the rna is detected that means there is a possibility of the covid presence in your wastewater um in my opinion if it's a treated wastewater it's a process through the wastewater it has got all disinfections gone including the uh, um, uv and uh, chlorine um it is not going to stabilize itself because if you look at it ms2 coliphage which is typically used as a surrogate indicator for various viruses um it gets deactivated by normal chlorine dose of 2 mg per liter with a ct of 5 um similarly with uv so i don't think there's not much research research on that but i think whatever research available including epas and that from delft the netherlands and others or swedish they are saying it's an rna that has been shown but only so, one care people have to take who are working on raw sewage for example pumps yes, screens yes. etc they have to it's be not, extremely careful uh next question from mr shah what is the from tce i guess he started consulting engineers what is the cost of onm uh, per cubic meter uh, per mld for thermal desalination and what is steam consumption per mld of treated water 
So it's a, it's a good question. It's like uh, the the conversion ratio. It's like the one is to ten is the good number. Mm -hmm. So the one ton of steam can generate a ten meter cube of uh, water. It mm -hmm. can varies, uh, but this is the the ten could be a uh, you know the approximately good number to consider for your cost calculation. And the opex is uh, pretty similar to your uh, the uh, RO plants. So it's like uh, close to 30 rupees or less than that, you know, rough number, but okay. it's, it's, uh, it can be verified with the size of the plant. Okay. Next question, sir, is from Vidya Dhage, and I'll go to Dr. Patil for that. Sapnil Patil. What typical process does power plant follow for cooling tower recycle? Dr. Patil? <laughs> Power plant, there are two types of cycles. One is the open cycle, uh, typically on the coastal plants. Uh, other is uh, where, where there is pro cycle. So in Srimadri, and as well as in Balu, uh, we have pro cycle. Uh, so we take the seawater and then uh, we operate in pro cycle. And one part of that seawater we are converting as for recycling. And if we put up recycling plant within the uh, cold waste plant, then uh, this brine is not an issue. Because we have to push huge amount of bias anyway, or bottom as anyway. Okay. Uh, the next question I will send to Dr. Kelkar. What is the status of forward osmosis for desalination in India? And um, I'm not yeah. honestly fully aware yeah. on that research yeah. because uh, it's still uh, ongoing. Yeah. So Shuffle. I may not be able to answer that question on FORO. I think it's still, still ongoing. That's all all yeah, forward osmosis. The biggest problem is regeneration of that. Uh, what is the power power water or mother water whatever you call it mm -hmm. so this is a mostly ammonia solution or carbon dioxide solution which is uh, tds is more than sea water that's why the farmer right. osmosis takes place it's a reverse of the reverse <laughs> osmosis but how do you get that uh, water separated from that uh, main solution drawdown solution it's called drawdown solution so how do you again separate uh, water and carbon dioxide or ammonia you, you need heat energy Okay. So that's why it's not yet proven or uh, it did not take so, or, or further, uh, it did not develop further. Okay, uh, Mr. Shah, next question for you. Any from Arun Kumar, any technology foreseen in the near future to boost recovery of seawater desalination from typical range of around 40 to 45 percent? Not really. I, I don't see that uh, with. Uh, with the current situation because it or uh, again add on to the cost, you know, because it's like again the cost economics. Right. So, uh, again, a question from Hari Prasad Cherokapali. In a state like AP, what would you recommend uh, a beginning MLD? Where, where do we, what should be the smallest MLD? 100 MLD to begin with could be good size if they have the compelling need. Again, I see that the, the discussing the MLD is not a right approach. Okay. It's, it's about the what's the need and uh, there is a willingness to pay, you know. There should be buyer actually. Otherwise, no developer will make money and uh, the project will never fly. No finances will be available. So the question lies around the feasibility of the whole thing, the technology available for all capacities. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kelkar, uh, the question, this person doesn't mention their name. Raising doubts about marine pollution due to desalination. Is there any study to prove this or did we take this issue seriously or not? Marine pollution due to desalination. <laughs> Honestly, um, every coin will have two sides. Um, right. you, you take one side and say it's going to be a polluting, so don't do it. Or we do more advanced data and analysis and say, okay, we can do it in such and such fashion so that it will reduce the pollution. Okay. Um, certainly, we need to look at for reducing the pollution and understand how it is. And it won't be a, it will be a site-specific constraint. It will be site-specific areas. For example, if you have coral leaves, in the area where you're drawing the drawing the water from, then right. definitely how to discharge it back into the coral leaves will be a definitely a solution to look at it. So people who build the plants or clients who build the plan do look into all these assessments and then provide the information and then take a, 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 a literally analyzed decision how to go by. So okay. that's, that's similar all. Question, a similar question or comment is, is discharge of brine or sludge into sea affect marine life or not? Yes, I guess you've given the answer. It's a, it does affect, but it depends on uh, all of and it, it, That's the best way to do it, honestly, because the cost otherwise gets increasing substantially higher of treating. And there are studies being done how to do it. So I think that may need to push the cost up, up front, but it will save a lot by not doing it. 
a question from Bridget Justin uh, for Mr. Shah. How much percentage of wastewater is coming from diesel plants? Any numbers we know? So this is like what you use as a permit. Rest all is the waste. So right. the forty percent is the recovery. Let's say if we are talking about okay. right. So sixty percent is the brine, okay. and that we need to discharge back to the sea. And as Dr. Kilker explained, and uh, it's like the outfall is also a very experienced subject. You know, it is not that you draw pipe and leave it there because the local concentration of salt and other things can impact marine life. So the diffusers and the way you design your outfall makes all the difference. So the bathymetry study and uh, detail, uh, you know, the sound engineering is required there. Okay. Uh, for a question from Ravi Ulangwar, again, I'm sorry for you, Mr. Shah. What types of pumps are being used for intake seawater station? What are the challenges due to highly corrosive seawater? So generally we design if possible, it's like the gravity intake as, as uh, much as possible. We, again, there are two advantages. One is like the... Uh, the power cost and uh, second is like the convenience because the pump is like the moving machine and uh, have its own maintenance. But these are the special pumps which is for uh, the specialty metallurgy and the very high power rating. So it's it's like uh, the moving screens are there as a part of the pretreatment. So the macro fouling elements should not sucked in and uh, even at the intake station, you do take care that the marine uh, uh, you know, the species don't suck into the intake. So the velocity is very, very less. So, okay. you know, they sense this, uh, you know, the difference in velocity and uh, can move away from the suction line. So, yes, intake is also... Can I, can I have the panel for five more minutes? Is that okay? Can we have five more minutes of your time? Okay. Uh, Mr. Okay. Suryam, yes. Just five more minutes. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Mr. Suryam, next question for you uh, from Akhilesh Pandey. Pre-treatment before desalination being very important in terms of OPEX and membrane life. Uh, don't you think replacing the conventional pre-treatment with an innovative media can make a difference? Yeah, in fact, uh, IDE also has uh, developed such techniques. Without chlorination, we are operating our uh, desal plant, RO plant. Mm -hmm. And if you do chlorination, it breaks the organics into much uh, finer particles and ultimately membrane falling will be more. So we have a sand maturation bed and we don't use any chlorine in the RO plant. Okay. So that so, itself is one a good idea of improving the pretreatment and improving the life of membranes. And then second, we have installed, installed ultrafiltration. In fact, now ultrafiltration has become a mandate almost in all um, RO plants as a prerequisite for, at least in India. Israel and all you don't need because the seawater is so clean that a simple sand filtration is more than sufficient. But yes, ultrafiltration is very, very important and depends on the water quality and based on that only you have to design. Uh, sir, another question for you related to the earlier question. If uh, this is what the person was asking about sir, uh, sludge, if you use pipeline, uh, won't it get choked, choked due to high amount of salts? No, it has to be the pressurized pipeline and a proper dispersion modeling has to be done away from the intake point. Okay. And there is no question of chokage. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a Question from Saurav Das Patnaik. He's a CEO of Swatch Environment. Uh, I guess to Mr. Shah, can you please elaborate on opportunities for providing packaged containerized desalination units mm -hmm. in the range of two to twenty? Uh, because they're looking at it as a both investment and leasing of such an equipment to their to their clients. Very much yes. This is something where we look at the opportunity to make in India. And uh, this is something which is like the dispersed diesel plant versus the large at one place. So in situ kind of a desalination, I agree. So okay. You, okay. You, can, you can specifically write to us. I think that's an interesting model to answer. Mr. Mr. Kumar, a question from Deepak uh, Chokanpalli. I want to know what are the discharge standards applicable to for discharge of brine? I think although Mr. Nishar sort of answered that earlier, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because uh, there is no such specific standard for because we are discharging uh, uh, 60 to 70 percentage of the brine. So uh, the only thing for a proper dispersion, we have to have a design of dispersing the sludge yeah. which is dispersed to the sea. Apart from that, there is no such. And again, the suspended solids has to be taken care. You know, we have to have some kind of treatment in the uh, desal plant itself so that we can, you know, have a minimum amount of sludge going to the sea. Uh, for the brine, we cannot have that because it depends on the recovery and uh, so straight away it will go to the sea. Okay. Mr. Shah, in an intake system, what can be the maximum length of channel that you can have in the sea? 
So we can go up to even the three or four kilometers. Even some cases like the Dahil sir has mentioned, it's like uh, we cannot see the blue sea. Okay. And if, if there is a good possibility of getting the water, which is much better than 2000 ppm of TSS, we won't mind going to deeper, deeper sea and uh, reduce the challenges post the water is on. Okay, sir, I'll, be, I'll be a little faster. I want to finish in a few minutes. So I'm sorry, yeah. but now there's another follow-up question for you, Mr. Shah. Uh, how long will the environmental clearance take place for these uh, containerized units? So the container doesn't require environment uh, clearance. It's like the someone who is a user needs okay. to guarantee that. So it's it's like the package versus. So it's like you have to connect the pipe. So right. it lies on the user. Okay. Hello, hello. If I can say something, uh, there has already been an inter-governmental uh, agreement between government of Israel and government of India in producing similar type of vehicle-mounted uh, RO units small size to package size and he can get an information from the Israeli embassy or the government of India water resource department. Okay. Uh, I didn't realize you could have bilateral agreements there. I thought this was a sovereign matter, but nonetheless, I'll pass on that. Uh, do you... Yes, sir, uh, I have a small question. Yeah, please, sir. If I can. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, maybe this is to Mr. Shah. So yeah. for my understanding, I just would like to understand, Mr. Shah, what is the approximate price per KL? I mean, if you see Gujarat, you are already doing it. And then Chennai, you are already doing it. What is the price per KL that which uh, maybe if AP has to purchase, what could be the price that we can expect? So the Chennai model and Gujarat model are two different models where Chennai is not the for the purchase agreement. This is EPC plus uh, O&M. And Gujarat is okay. hybrid annuity where the government infuse, as Mr. Manoj Kumar said, Gujarat government has infused the 40% of the capex. And uh, we are not doing that plant. That plant been done by Sapoji Palanji with Aquatech. But uh, yes, I okay. can tell okay. you that the typical numbers would be around uh, less than a dollar. And uh, it's like the 50 to 60 rupees to, to give you a ballpark number uh, without the capex investment, pure play. But there is a there is a guarantee which is required in terms of the purchase uh, agreement. So the, this much of a water, there is a buyer and uh, there is a surety to pay. So uh, we'll just take two or three more questions. That's it. So we can close this. Uh, this is a question. Wow, there are quite a few that have suddenly come in. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Kilker, very briefly, sir, in comparison to desalination plant, effluent recycling, seawater desalination and sewage recycling, which one is most more technoeconomically preferable i'm assuming the answer depends it depends both. right both and depends okay you uh, already answered it okay. from anil bagel i think nf consideration will be better to enhance the ro membrane's life can nf be used to reduce the brine of ro and enhance the recovery of ro i guess is what he means uh, mr shah it's, it's 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 quite possible you can use nf uh, but again you're going to add another small brine through the nf okay. so that's to be dealt with anyway so there are projects where nf is used or you have uh, um, RO combination is used. So it depends upon water quality, pretreatment, and several other issues. I have, we have a question from Aga Khan. Uh, he says, uh, thanking you all. He's from Karachi, Pakistan, and Illumina Fallacy. He wants to know, uh, he's doing research on desalination. He wants to know the impact of Gujarat desalination facility pre and post uh, in terms of uh, water production. So, Mr. Kumar. Yeah, so these environmental aspects have been already considered uh, uh, by uh, you know, the DPR, the detailed. Uh, uh, project report was made uh, to have uh, you know to minimize the impact on the environment. So, <clears throat> of course, uh, when we dispose the 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 the, the brine back to the uh, seed, so there will be uh, some kind of you know uh, the concentration of the you know the 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 sea will be have you know uh, will be have some kinds. But again, we are disposing it through you know the dispersion like diffuser systems. And uh, and also the plant will have also a kind of uh, you know, pretreatment system which will also reduce you know, the, all the chemicals will be treated as much as we can. So there will be an environment impact assessment study will be going on, and as part of this project, is also we are going to get the uh, permissions from the the CR reset and the Ministry of Environment and Forest. So what are the norms from the the, the statutory governments? Of course, we will will follow up. And we will ensure that minimum environment impacts are, you know, a cause.